so guys, um, Innovating Humanity uh, podcast about uh, looking from different perspectives, news perspectives, how we can um, uh, upgrade our potential as individuals and society uh, as a whole. And uh, we have really wonderful guest um, today, uh, Nicolas Sederac from uh, France, from um, Paris. Uh, you have 25 degrees there. That's wonderful, mild weather. I suppose you had a heat wave, as a huge heat wave, right, in Paris yeah, as well? Yeah, nice. Last week it was 40. 40. Even, I, I, even, I even had 44. Wow. In and the, In the backyard. <laughs> and you are the one who likes uh, hot weather or, or what about you? No, I kind of, kind of like it. But at 40, <laughs> it's a little bit hard. But okay, uh, okay. I, I, I was not that bad. Okay, I know guys who are just hating this uh, hot weather and they are, they yeah. can do can do anything uh, kind of that. My uh, uh, my perception is like uh, I I prefer rather hot than rather cold kind of that. Anyways, um, we have great conversation. I suppose uh, we will have great conversation because we have this huge topic about uh, better education, better learning ways, better learning style. So, uh, Nicola, you are one of the co-creator of uh, peer-to-peer learning uh, process in uh, in in in, in uh, school talent zero one, and maybe you can just in some uh, some, some uh, short word sentences describe, for example, three aspects what we would know, what we should know about you. Uh, as a professional okay that's that's uh, i will be difficult to make it very short but uh, j- just to a little bit uh, position myself so first i am uh, i am uh, i have been educated as a physicist okay i got uh, I, I did physics mainly in usa i studied at ucla and stanford and i never worked as a physicist by the way uh, i was very early involved in the hacker scene uh, and i found the first uh, pen test company in France. Okay, pen test, you know, cyber security pen test. And at this time, it was, it was we found it in 1991, I think. Uh, so at this time, it was, we had a very, very big success. The company was really successful, but it was almost impossible to find talent at this time. Uh, and I was, as a partner of the company, we were five hackers. We started the company and we had plenty of demand from company. We couldn't fulfill them. And as a partner, I was kind of in charge of trying to educate and to train uh, uh, future hackers for our company. And slowly by slowly, I had much more fun in the education process than in the business and in the hacking process. So I shift to education and I I start to educate educate people. Uh, So what is important to understand is I, I am not from a education background. I was not planning to be a teacher at all. That was absolutely not my plan. Uh, but I, I went uh, there by, by necessity. Then after, because it, was, it became a passion. Uh, so first, when we, the problem we had, it's the fact that when you had engineers coming from university in France, and in France, we have a um, dual system. I don't know how it's, uh, it's a little bit unusual in the in the rest of the world we have what we call engineering school which are not inside university and are supposed to be higher levels than the university uh, but when you get students out of those uh, schools or out of the university you had very un um, i would say un, unable uh, they were not able to fulfill the need of our client unprepared they, very, they were un- unprepared yeah, it's not just unprepared because if you are looking for hacking, you are looking for people who are able to innovate. You know, you just you, there is no rules for hacking because if you have rules, of course, people adapt. That's the whole idea. Hacking, it's always something which is something new every day. Uh, and we had people who were very trained. They would know everything they have to know, but they are not able to innovate and they are not able to have new ideas. That's the whole idea. And I think it's a very specific field where you really need to to evolve all the time because what is true one day, it's not true the, the day after. And something which is the best practice in a, in a week can be like a month later, a very dangerous situation. So it's, it's a little bit specific way of uh, uh, a specific work. Uh, and so we didn't find anyone who was uh, that there was a little bit an hacker scene in Paris, but most of the people in the hacker scene didn't want to work. They didn't want to be employee in a company. Uh, so it was difficult. So I started to train 
people. So first, I went to uh, university. So I was a university teacher. Uh, I work with Paris, which is the best uh, technical university in Paris. Uh, it was almost impossible because I tried to make it very hands-on because we need people right, really right away. And the way of teaching was not uh, possible. They, were, they wanted me to do lectures and exams and it was all what it was what was practical was rejected by the uh, by the academy so i i couldn't make it there so just to be precise uh, you were offering some practical uh, practices right and they were rejecting yeah. that and you wanted uh, they wanted exactly. to, to do it all all, school, all style okay I, exactly I, I had a phd in physics so it was easy to be a teacher it was okay but when i start to be very practical and mm. to have uh, rather than to have those class where i don't ask the students to have a lecture and to have exams, but more doing project. The academy was questioning what I was doing, challenging, and they, many they didn't accept. They were not agreeing on the on the process. And I, of course, I was a teacher. I was part of a faculty, so I couldn't I couldn't impose. I couldn't force them to change the way. I tried, but they did not want to. So it was really a, a big failure. So uh, even that- so. So in this Even moment, in this, mo- in this sorry, in, in this moment, you kind of started to understand that you would like to do this educational process differently. More emphasis on two things, what I understand: one is practical, and second thing is that those students have to be able to be innovate afterwards. They, uh, yeah. they hit the uh, labor market, right? That was I, I was there just for that. I was not. I was not. Uh, I, I wasn't paid for. The, I was paid by the university, but that was not my goal. My goal was to find the good students for me for our company, and. We had really practical project coming from the company. And when I tried to expose the students to them, there was clearly a rejection from the university. They did not want to, uh, mainly because they were saying we have to, there is no theory. It's very, uh, you are making robots or whatever. They were clearly disagreeing on the idea itself. And for them, we have to, to teach very uh, abstract and very far from practical uh, idea. So, you know, this story is about what happens when teacher needs good real life outcome. So you, yeah. you yourself needed real life outcome. It was not uh, your teacher who is disconnected from life, right? You were really in connection with life. You needed this yeah. student to do good. Really? So, and that's what happens. That's what happens. You want practical and you want real life applications and you want to have innovations, right? Okay. Yeah, because I was there only for that. I was not there to teach. I was there to find talent. It was very simple. So I, I had to quit from the university. I worked there for around six months in part time because I was also managing the company. And uh, so there was a pension. And at this time, I tried to work. I tried to find some uh, private school that were more flexible. And I indeed find one it was called Epita, which is, by the way, now ranking first in, in IT in France. It's an engineering school, so it's still a state-recognized school. It give a it give a degree recognized by state, uh, but they were as they were as they were private. They were much more concerned to be efficient so that the students find jobs, uh, and they let me start uh, a more hands-on teaching. I did that for around two or three years. So I developed techniques to do what I would call hands-on teaching. I, it's not uh, yeah, yet yet. 100% peer to peer. It's not 100% project based learning. Mainly what it was done, it was lectures and project after the lectures. Okay, so I was mainly doing like every teacher having the theoretical part in lectures, but each time we had apply a project on this with real companies. Uh, it worked pretty well. We had quite good results. Um, but so when it worked, we, we had some problem because of the, it was difficult to scale, mainly because when, when you do project, uh, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time for the teacher and the company. Okay. So most of the company are willing to have one or two groups working on their project. Okay. But when you have like 20 or 100, it takes too much time. So the company don't have the time to follow the 20 groups or the 100 groups. That's not possible. Uh, so I tried to find teacher to do that in, in this private school. It was not possible because most teachers were not able. I mean, what the project of the company were much higher of the skills of the teacher because uh, mainly 
well, if we are very uh, honest, when you are good in IT, you don't go to teach. Okay, it's very clear. You go to a company, first it's much more paid and usually it's much more fun. So you don't have very high skill practical teacher. Okay, so there is some who are very good in theory, but on really practical stuff, you don't have much. So we, we had very fast a shortage. Uh, it was very difficult because I tried to manage them, but uh, when you have like, uh, at this time, I think we had like 300 students. Okay, so it takes too much time for only one teacher to follow that. Uh, and at this time, what we did, we find that we could use some of the students to follow the project of others. So we create a subgroup of students that we call assistant teacher. And we call them, by the way, Aztec, which was assistant technical, like it was a little bit of joke for Aztecs and stuff like that. But, and then we use those students as gateway between the teacher, which was me and we were actually, I find someone else working with me and the students and the company. So we had each time a company, a group of students who were managing the whole, band, the whole batch of students and a teacher which was mainly behind because we did not have time, but we were kind of synchronizing all that. That worked really wonderful for like 15 years, okay? And we go another school called Epitech, which is a branch out of uh, Epita. And now it's it ranked first in France in, in the IT school, not because we have engineering IT school and we have IT school. So it means that Epita give a master, give an engineering degree, Epitech give a computer science degree. So it's a bit different in the way, but mainly those two schools are ranking first, first and second in France. And they came from this methodology. So I developed that for 15 years. We did that for all field, not only IT. We did even like, for example, writing. We did mathematics. We did everything as project based. We find projects from companies. Sometimes we create a project like in mathematics. We create projects from nowhere. But we, at the end of the day, there was no more anything which was graded out of a project. We grade only on concrete realization with a project. And it's great by other students. So I managed that for 20 years, for 15 years. And when I started, we were 60. When I left, it was 6,000. And there was 13 countries. So the, the whole stuff worked pretty well. And after, and so I was promoting a lot what I would call active pedagogy. Okay, Nicola, just just one, just a little bit to rewind. Uh, so you you told this one one concept, but it like kind of really hit me uh, regarding that if you are good in IT you're not going to teach if you are successful yeah. in IT, right? So actually, <clears throat> does this happen actually globally until this moment? Because we have this huge shortage of coders, right? Globally, sh um, huge shortage. Maybe this is one of the causes. So for example, really, I am good in IT. I have good money. I, I don't know. 3,000 euros is kind of basic, right? And it can be up to 20,000 euros per month or 50,000 euros per month, right? So this yeah, is kind of one of the... Me. So, and this is one of the biggest problem. Uh, therefore, we don't have this uh, huge scale of new uh, coders appearing in the market. One of the reasons. I don't I don't think it's a, it's a main reason. It's a, it's one a off, reason, one but off. it's not the... It's one of the reasons, of course, but it's not the main reason. Uh, so I, I will keep starting and explaining because you will more understand how it, uh, it, it, uh, it happens, so it's easier. So at this time, I managed the school and we were very successful training like uh, a little less than 1,000 coders each year and going in the best company. Okay? And at this time, I was uh, promoting this active pedagogy. Uh, I was doing a lot of TV show and a lot of activity and one day, uh, there was a guy who kind of, I was on a TV show and he said, he was, he was telling me, okay, Nicola, you are doing a wonderful job, uh, but it's for rich people only because it's a private school. And actually at this time, it was the most expensive IT private school in France. Okay, so we were the most expensive. Uh, he said, okay, it's very, it's only for rich and it's also for good academic students because at this time we were selecting, I would say, maybe one one out of 1,000 best students out of high school in France. So we were, we were very selective and very, very expensive. Uh, and he said, okay, me, I am, I am managing a foundation. So I am taking care of two people and most of them are dropout. Okay, so you are speaking wonderfully about your new way of teaching, but 
can maybe you can, can you help us? Can you help those kind of uh, students? And I say, okay, let's try. I, I absolutely don't know. Uh, what I know is uh, that he has gave some wonderful result for our students, but uh, I don't know. Okay, and so we try, and we so the guy and I said, okay, so the problem we are private, so I can't teach for nothing. Okay, and he said, okay, I will manage the, the I will manage the finance part. I am a foundation. I will find money, and he find money, and so we decide to try on 50 students. Okay, so we took 50 students who were from poor background, really poor background, so very, very poor suburb, and who drop high school before graduating high school. Okay, most of them around 16, they drop high school. So that was the deal. Take students only if they drop high school and only if they are from poor background. So we find 50 uh, uh, students, actually we didn't find the, the, the foundation find it, find them, sorry. And we start to train them with the same methodology that's what we use for our students, but in, in a much lower expectation goal. So what we thought at this time, okay, I was very, I, I am from a very scientific background, a very scientific family, okay, I, I did scientific study. So I really was not sure at all of what we were doing. I was really convinced that to be a good coder, you, be, you need to be a good mathematician. So that was really in my mind very deep. I didn't really know why, but that was the way it was. So I was not expecting to make uh, IT engineers. Okay, We were targeting some like uh, web integrator or stuff like that. But at this time in France, there was a lot, a lot of need of people doing web integration. So we say, okay, they will find job in a basic job. That was the idea. And we start teaching on the same inside the school. So we mix them with our students, but on a, on a specific curriculum. And the first surprise, it's after two years, they got the same jobs. Okay, they got exactly the same jobs that our students who were trained for five years by being some of the best uh, high school students and from rich family. After two years, those kids coming from a suburb were not educated, have at least dropped by out school, did get the same jobs with the same salaries that a normal student. So that was really striking for me. Everyone was surprised. But at this time, we say, okay, there is a so big shortage. Okay, they are, they are, the company are willing to take anyone who can code a little bit and they expect them to, to maybe progress or whatever. So we look a little bit more in detail. And no, they were really doing the same jobs and having the same kind of result. And at this time, we were once more very lucky, one girl in this first batch ended up in Xavier Niel company. Uh, I don't know if you know Xavier Niel. Uh, he owns the company Free, which is a French third operator. It's a billionaire. He, he is a 10 richest guy in France. He comes from IT, get rich in IT, and he has a very, very techy company. Okay, it's a, it's a very techy culture. And after one year, this girl in this company, it's one of the best. Is part of the best engineer of the company. Uh, and so that's, you just have to imagine the situation. Okay. She, at this time, she is 23 or 25, something like that. She's very young. She's from North Africa. Okay. She has dreads, you know, the long hair to the knee. Okay. She wear all kind of colors. Okay. Okay. If you go to free on the, on the tech company inside the area, you have only male. They are mostly around 40. They are dressed in black, okay? And they are very techy, okay? And that's also. So you can see her from very far. They have, they have a big open space. You see her from the entrance, okay? And she's one of the best in this company. And one day she has to spoke with the, with the owner, Xavier, who I already know because the manager, the manager of the network there, it's, a, it's an alumni of Epitech. And the manager of the IT, it's also an enemy of Epita. So we know this company very well. So he, he called me and said, okay, Nicole, uh, she, he, he asked to spoke with her, okay? And he asked her, where do you come from? What did you do before? Okay, because when, when you own an IT company, when you find someone good, you always try to find where he comes from. Maybe there is other there. There is another way. And she said, two years ago, I was selling pets in a pet shop. She was a seller in one of the French pet shops. And uh, she was actually, she was selling hamsters. And uh, he said, okay, that's not 
What is going on? It's not normal. She called me. So that Xavier called me and said, Nicola, what's going on? Uh, I am looking for talent everywhere. Uh, no one can find any talent. We can't keep them. I have people hunting them all over the world. And I just heard one of my best engineers was a pet seller two years ago. This is crazy. What, what's going on? And uh, I explained him. I told him what we were doing. And he said, okay, I don't believe you. That bullshit. Uh, maybe she's a genius. I said, no, no, we, we trained 50 and all those 50 are working for companies. By the way, some are working in some of your other companies. Say, okay, I'm going, I want to see them. So we want to see others. And he said, okay, that's marvelous. Why do you do 50? We need thousands. We need thousands of them. So it's very simple. It's paid by a small foundation. They can pay for 50, we do 50. If they pay for 200, we do 200. If they pay. And he said, okay, let's say we want to do 10,000. How much will it cost, okay? Uh, let's say we in the next 10 years, we do 1,000 per year. Well, how much will it cost? I, I make the computation. I say it will cost around one, 100 million euros. So, okay, let's do it. Start. And we start the school 42. Okay. So the school 42 in Paris, it's a foundation which has, has a mission to train to, to 1,000 students each year. Okay. And what Xavier told me, he said, okay, when we start the school, he said, don't care about any regulation. Don't care about any degree. Do what you think is the best. Okay. So when I was managing Epitech and when we did the Web Academy, we were still in the French education system because we delivered a degree. Okay. Which has some constraints. One of the biggest constraints we have is one teacher every 20 students. That's part mm -hmm. of the rule. In France, mm -hmm. you are not allowed to have a degree if you don't have one teacher every student. If you are an IT school, if you are an engineering school, it's one teacher each eight students. That's settled in the marble. When we started, uh, when we start uh, 42, we sorry, sorry, had Nicola, no Nicola, just just a little bit uh, perspective. So, at what uh, time uh, school 42 started? 2013. Uh, 2013. 2013. Okay. Rewind a little bit more. Uh, what was the year when uh, this uh, girl from North Africa with the dreads and some pet shop uh, oh, seller, was, what was the year when uh, this, was, this guy, uh, when she yeah, hit uh, the, the high, high manager uh, level? It was one year before. Uh, 12, 2012, something like that. Yeah. So uh, he called me, you know, he called me, it was the 24th September. Okay, 24th September. Okay, okay. Good to know. September of 2012. Okay, okay, okay. And, uh, I, I thought it was a joke, by the way. Because... <laughs> okay. <laughs> but okay, whatever, so, whatever. Yeah. And so we went very fast. Mm -hmm. Very, very fast. Because we even started the school in a building which was not finished. Okay, so mm. it was really... Uh, you know, this guy is really pushy. So he makes stuff go. So we mm. went very fast. Uh, and the program... The program of Web Academy start two years before. Okay, so uh, I don't know, in 2010. Okay, so we start like this. And so what we saw in, in Epitech, we saw that when we had those students who were assistant, uh, that's very regulated. So we have, we can't have too much. There is a regulation. So we had one assistant every 100 students. Okay, that was a regulation. Uh, but what we what we saw, those students who were assistants were progressing much better than others. But when I say much better, really much better. And uh, but we couldn't change that. That was a regulation. When we start forty two, we say, okay, why don't we put every student assistant? Okay, so we tried, we tried that, and that starts the peer to peer. Okay, mm -hmm. so we remove all teacher. I mean, remove all teachers. There is no teacher at all, zero. But all students are acting as assistants, okay? And that is a peer-to-peer -peer process, okay? And that worked and amazingly. We had, at start, we were kind of challenging it. So we had a group of assistants specific who were also grading students to see if there was a big difference. And at the end of the day, we saw that it worked much better with everyone assistant. And that has amazing results. We had... Actually, we won all the contexts worldwide of, of coding, of uh, AI, of blockchain, or whatever. So this is how it works. It works with no teacher at all, full gamified, okay, and with uh, a process which is... Um, so I think the best way to imagine it, it's uh, imagine what you have in a game like World of Warcraft, 
where you, you remove the dungeon and you put IT challenge. Okay. If you see the skills people develop in those kind of games, they are amazing. They are much higher than what you get in any school. Okay. Because they are not anymore focused on knowledge transmission because we believe that knowledge has absolutely no use anymore. We believe the only use, the only stuff which is interesting, it's how do you create new ideas as a group? And we focus only on that. And after you can get knowledge and stuff like that. So my belief today is that we are speaking about globally on education. Uh, the education system has its focus on knowledge transmission, which has been useful for long, okay? But which is totally unrelevant today because knowledge is available. And we are more and more AIs who are able to do all the knowledge retention and knowledge treatment. So everything which is only based on knowledge retention and knowledge treatment will be done by your software. So what is important today is to have people who are co-creative, who are able to co-create something together. So you need to have two skills, one which is creativity and one which is interaction with others. And this peer-to-peer -peer process does exactly develop those two skills because it's what you need. What is second skill? Sorry, first was uh, creativity and second one? So when it's, it's co the capability to co-create, create collective intelligence. Kind of okay, collaboration so and all that stuff. Collaboration. It's, so a little, it's a little bit different than collaboration, okay. uh, which is more adding skills. That there it's interacting with skills. Uh, it's uh, the, the MIT develop a concept which they call active open mindness, which is the basic component of these skills. The skills is, uh, for example, you are you are in front of a problem. Okay, you don't know how to solve this problem at all. No one. You are a group of four. Okay, no one knows how to solve it. So there is no skills. Okay, and by the discussion in between you, you are going to find the solution. Okay. And that requires some skills, which is a mix of openness. You are able to listen to others, but still you have also to have your own ideas and to carry on. And I always say you develop yourself when you disagree with someone, when you try to convince someone of something and each other, by doing that, you go far in the understanding of the situation or in the new ideas. So that's exactly what we call it. We call that collective intelligence. And that's what they learn to do by doing doing this kind of curriculum. So creativity and the second is like um, uh, collective creativity, right? To create yeah, something exactly. together. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Exactly. You have people who are very, very creative by themselves, but mm. who are totally unable to interact with others. And I think we have today in front of problems who are, who are, which are too complex to have individual creativity. I, I mainly would say most of the problems with which are accessible to individual creativity have already been solved. So now we are in problem which are much too complex for individuals. So you need a group of creativity. I agreed. I uh, couldn't agree. More. Okay. And there, is, there is a wonderful book on that, which is called Supermind, which is written by someone from Stanford, which is amazing. And they, they had plenty of experience. They can describe how a group of people, of people who are not experts, deliver much better results than individual experts. And even when you put individual experts inside a group of non-experts, most of the time it screw up the whole system because the guy is not able to interact correctly with others. It kind of break the creativity dynamic. Wow, there is a lot, a lot to uh, uh, open into this uh, topic because uh, when you say this expert and non-experts, when they interact, that uh, expert becomes less creative. Uh, there have been a lot of, lot, of, lot of studies about Torrance tests, for example, right? Or something like that, maybe you know, about creativity, that, for example, education uh, stifles creativity in some sense, that there are a lot of regulations, that have rules, that have rules, and we are kind of uh, going out of our creativity. We are going into moving into this uh, rule mode, right? And when we are in yeah. the rule mode, we are uh, and, uh, kind of adopting to this game when we don't have a wide uh, range of possibilities, but into this uh, realm of rules, right? It's it's even even it's even a little bit worse than that. Um, I, I always tend to say, if, if you read my book, I, I wrote like um, learning. Okay, it's it's mainly unuseful, dangerous, and make you stupid. Uh, so mainly on the part make you stupid. What I mean, 
Uh, the problem is when, when it comes to creativity, it, it goes to risk. Okay, you have to to take risk. And as a human, we have something which is very um, difficult: is we are risk adversaries. I mean, Absolutely, we get yeah. intoxicated by safety. When social con- social conformity, uh, fear of sorry, rejection, uh, yeah. exclusion, something like that. Yeah. And, and and it comes from very simple because uh, many when when you are in front of a, you have to take a decision. Okay, so you you are in front of a problem and you have to take, for example, you have two doors. Okay. And you have to choose, okay, I go to the right or I go to the left. Very simple stuff, okay? Either you know where to go, okay? Because someone told you and you have been teach uh, where to go. So you open the good door and everything is fine. So, but now when you don't know, you have to take a risk. And a level of risk, it's something that we get used to. So when you are in a normal education system, you have been always in a situation to open doors only when you know how to. And each time you fail, you get yelled at. You get a bad grade or you get something. So usually when you get in a situation to have a question, you don't know the answer, your brain think, okay, first, maybe I did not understand the question, okay? Or they are going to give me the answer, but it's just a question of weight. So most of the time you don't take the risk, you just put yourself in a blurry situation. And we now have uh, cerebral images that shows that. I mean, when you show a situation unknown to an educated student, is full of fear. If you show the same situation to an uneducated, from someone, from my example, from from a, a Bushman or something like that, who have no education, is full of joy. Normally, as human, when you have something which is new, you are supposed to find it fun and interesting. Your kids is what he's doing. But after 10 years of education, you are full of fear because you know that you are going to be yelled at if you don't give a good answer. So we educate people to kind of uh, replicate only and answer only when they know. That's reduced. It doesn't mean that it, it's what is funny. Most of the time, you will have the ideas in your mind, but you will reject them by yourself. So it's a kind of self, uh, uh, self-restriction. self okay? And that comes from the normal education system because you are using a pathway in your mind, always answering, already answer question, never get out of the track, and we start very early at, at the kindergarten. When the kid has a strange ID, the teacher will make fun of him in front of everyone. And then he will learn that it's not a good way to, to behave. When you have something strange, we always use the group as a way to, re, to make you feel bad, which is maybe the worst stuff we can do because we are social animals. When the rest of the group laugh of you, it's terrible. And if you do that for a kid around four or five, you will deeply in, in put, put in, in him the fact that uh, new ideas or strange ideas are, are bad. And that's what we do in education. So we have to restore this system. Uh, we have to make it okay to fail, okay to do it again, try and stuff like that. But that's a big change, okay? Because, um, yeah, we have been educated for long that way. And what is funny, we, we find that those students who drop out are less armed than most of them, okay? Because they have been less exposed or at least they didn't accept this game so deep, okay? So they are able to go faster in this innovation process. You know, you are preaching for the, for the choir and I'm just thinking, um, I've been always looking for uh, good scientific studies who can kind of show for the skeptics how it works because what you are saying, for example, I have been 15 years in media. I had media company, I had 16 employees. I had quite successful, I didn't have any uh, media diploma. Right now I'm for 11 years in education. I'm teacher of emotional intelligence. I have no uh, higher education university diploma. So I understand what you are saying. And my feeling is that uh, I am learning all the time. And the thing is you just have to have this willingness to learn, uh, willingness to go forward some, somewhere. The question right now is, and I have talked a lot about uh, the arrogance of educational system, uh, that they are kind of really arrogant in a sense that they are protecting their way of uh, doing things really arrogant and this is tragic in the sense that they are kind of skipping the needs uh, of human beings uh, and uh, ma- maybe I suppose Nic- Nicola you, you know a lot of studies maybe you have some kind of one crushing really really straight uh, straight ahead uh, to front um, study that shows how I don't know we are teached out of creativity 
So th- there is a very good book from um, Ken Robinson. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He has TED, TED, uh, TED Talk. Wonderful about the school. He uh, did a TED uh, Talk, but his yeah. book is wonderful because it's full of uh, scientific study on the subject mm, okay. uh, where you can see how we arm creativity. But uh, it, it doesn't give really really a uh, way to get it out, but it's a kind of very good uh, very good global thing of the situation. And also it kind of explain maybe how it was built, how this set up, because at the end of the day, uh, we, we are saying, uh, we are saying that's bad. That's not exactly bad. Uh, it was very adapt in a very specific situation. For example, when, when you want to train an army, okay? Uh, you an don't army, want army. people to be, yeah, army. If you, you have people in an army, you don't want them to be creative. You want them to follow, and that will make your army work. Okay. Uh, so this process uh, uh, was designed to create people to work in army, in church, you know, so or in factories, or in factories, for example. Yeah. But it came later. So first, we had to train. Mm. We were training people only militaries and only people from church. Okay, and there the discipline was much more important than the creativity. Okay, then we use the same process for the factory because in the factory most of the efficiency comes from the capability to do hmm. very precise job without getting out of any process. Okay? I that was that. very okay. mm-hmm. and and that was by the way very adapt to a situation of the industrial re, industrial revolution and that's part of what make Europe ahead of the rest of the world. You know, uh, I read a, I read a very nice article when they explain when they start to put factory in in Africa. One of the problems they couldn't get the people to stay seated during the whole day. People were not able to sit in a place and do a work during the whole day because mm. that's what you train in the school. If you don't go to school, you are not able. A normal being, human being can't stay doing the same thing Good during example. a day. It gets crazy. Okay, yeah. okay? Uh, and that's very interesting. So this. I would say education of the population was a real society advantage. Okay, but what is important? It changed. Now we are not anymore in the industrial revolution. All the work is done by uh, by machines, softwares. So what everything which is not creative will be done by a software. So we have to adapt to that. So the system was not a failure. It was very efficient to its target. So the question is the problem is the target change faster than ever. I think we never saw a so big evolution in the added value. And that's what, what is going on. And I think IT, it's a little bit ahead because when, when you do software, most of the work is done by your software. But in a few years, all the jobs which are not creative will be done by your software or by, by your robot. And that's going very fast. And most people don't understand that the intellectual work will go faster than the physical work because it's much harder to do a robot than to do an AI. So you will have now you have I have been working with a group of people working on on lawyer work doing by AI. It's very efficient. It's much easier than to have a robot going to pick up grape in a in a field. It's much harder. Uh, it's much technical. Okay. So in a very short time, every intellectual work, which is just knowledge and processing this knowledge, will be done by a software very efficiently in a much more uh, higher qualities that we can do with no uh, no mistake, no whatever, okay? Much better. For example, we were working like two years ago on uh, something which was analyzing image for cancer. The result of the software, it's like 20 times the best expert uh, in detect the cancer. Because it's, it's a, you know, it's a just, you think, for example, to have a specialist of cancer, you think it's a very, very high technical uh, education. But at the end of the day, it's a, uh, very very precise work it's not very much knowledge it's not a lot of talent it's m- plenty of knowledge and very precise the repetitive work and any human no human can keep his concentration long we are not able after two or three hours of full concentration most people not most 99 percent of people drop the concentration and our brain is not it's not designed to keep full concentration we are quite good to get very high short but in long term, it's difficult. Computers don't care. You can have full concentration during ever. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't change anything. And you get better each time. The computer, uh, when you have a deep learning process, it gets better every time. 
where while most humans get lower every time because they get tired. So most of the jobs are going to change. The added value is going to change. And our education system is not is not uh, evolving fast enough for many reasons. You, 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 you name one because it's a corporation and they protect themselves. They don't want to change because they have very nice and very uh, comfortable situation. Okay. And it's, a, you know, I have been working in France with a French uh, association. They do what they call reverse teaching. Okay. You, you, I, I know, you, I guess you know what is reverse teaching. You know, they don't teach in class. So, and they, in class, they have only debate and the students le- read the material at home. And during the class, they only speak and argue to each other. That's a process which gives amazing results in history, in uh, economics and stuff like that. There is plenty of figures of, on that. But when you do it in a, in a school, most of the time, one teacher reads some material on that and says, okay, I want to try, he starts, and he gives amazing results. And after usually eight to one year, eight months to one year, other teachers start to fight him. Why? Because many, it kind of disturbs them because as they have, as he has great result, the students complain about the others and say, okay, I'm going to the teacher there. It's very boring. When I am with Mr. Zen, it's amazing. Uh, I want to have the same everywhere. And then the guy who is doing the great work is pushed out by the others. Like they are, he is kind of disturbing the social peace inside the school. And that mainly what happened when I was in this university. I was doing a job. The students loved it. We, I had students coming at school in the evening and stuff like that. And it disturbs the, the process and people complain. They just complain, not because they, they don't even care about what I was doing. They just feel that they are kind of uh, degraded because they don't, uh, they don't have the same kind of result. And that's a corporation, a corporation process. Uh, I think I, maybe you heard a, a, a sentence of Jack Ma, which is very interesting. He said, universities are preparing bad robots. Uh, he's, and he was teaching in, he, he was teaching in university you know? he said we have a process which create bad robots okay uh, this is totally insane so and I think it's exactly that we have a process which was trying to have people working in factory or in a, in a, because when you say for example even intellectual activities in most companies are factories they repeat the same activity all the time okay so we have design a wonderful education system who make people able to do that in a very big skills with very high quality. Okay, we are able to make, for example, when you make a car, it's a very, very, very high quality process where you have to have people who act as robots. Clearly, a normal people don't do that. Okay, so we have learned how to train people to that and it has been wonderful, but now we have other way. Nicola, yeah. uh, so what you are telling, it's, it's kind of really uh, warmed my heart, you know, it's kind of preaching for the choir. Um, and uh, I have been telling this stuff for quite a time, what you are telling, uh, and uh, it's, it's like so, so nice to hear. The question for you would be, uh, how do you think, how radical are you? In terms of uh, right now establishment, what is in education, how radical do you think you are in this spectrum of whole education? Because what you are telling for me, It sounds so reasonable, so 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 logi- full of logic, right? That we need to creativity, we need uh, to to kind of uh, create different education. Strange question, but how do you think how radical you are regarding uh, to other uh, people in education? Oh, I think I'm totally radical, and I think I I kind of gave up to try to change the education system. I don't think it's possible. I try to build just next, uh, and that's why we create this. This zero run company. Uh, so 42 was amazing and still amazing. But 42, it's a it's a foundation. It's a non-profit process, and I don't think with a non-profit process you can solve the the issue. It's too big. Okay. So if we see it from uh, from a coding perspective, we need around five million coders right now. Gartner's group say r- around 20 million in 2030. The five million globally, we need. Yeah, worldwide. Worldwide. We yeah, need okay. five, there is a lack of five million coders right now. If you look at the Garnet Group figures, and it will be around 20 million in 2030. Okay, it's if you want to train millions of people, you have to be profitable. So I went out of 42 because 42 it's a non-profit organization which 
enforced not profit. And we train 10,000 people a year, but 10,000 is nothing. Okay, it's not enough for this scale. So the idea of, of Zone Zero One is to train millions. Okay, and to train millions, you have, we have to be profitable. Okay. In the same time, in the same time, we we saw that most of the students who we train have hard time to go to company, not to find jobs, they find jobs, but they don't manage well their career. Many because they are IT focused and they tend to stay on the same company when they start. They find a company, they go there and they stay there 10 years before looking. So so we, I, I really think we need a talent agency. We need to grow those people by experience and force them to move, to have like six months in a company during those three or first three or five first years to never stay more than six to one year in the same company so that they can mix their talent and not just solve a small problem for one company. So that's the whole idea of the run talent. The run talent, it's a talent agency which creates its own talent. Okay. Uh, Nicola, I was uh, in uh, Talent uh, Zero One uh, campus in London uh, just two, three weeks yeah. ago. And uh, I talked with students, I talked with uh, facilitators and, uh, and uh, Michelle, who, who was really uh, accommodating. And uh, I have re- this one really kind of uh, big question about soft skills. Um, do you plan to integrate more soft skills in Talent 01 uh, program uh, as it is? Because right now this is kind of uh, project-based, right? And, uh, and one of the aspects why I'm asking this is my feeling is that education should serve for three reasons. What education can give from K-12 or 1 to 12 grade and afterwards uh, lifelong learning is one is uh, to, to, to know how to be uh, in harmony with yourself fulfilled or happy. Second one is how to run family, how to be in family and third is for the uh, work. So these would be my three priorities. So therefore I'm asking about those soft skills that soft skills are so crucial from my perspective and uh, uh, evidently what you are telling me, uh, I, I, you are so, so uh, so educated uh, as uh, self-educated and uh, scientifically educated uh, guy. What do you think about that? So I, I do think we develop some skills. Uh, I do think we develop some skills because of the community. So I mean that if you don't behave correctly with others, as there is no hierarchy, you are going to be rejected by groups. So you have to adapt. Okay. So I think and, and we have studied about... So social conformity that, kind of bends you, right? Social conformity uh, uh, cre- uh, creates new habits uh, to be uh, agile, to, to communicate better, to get rid of stress and something like that. I, I wouldn't say social... Uh, I wouldn't say so- social conformity. I would say um, social interaction because you are in a group, okay? Uh, for example, you have, you have gold with your group, okay? If you don't behave correctly with the group, they will not work with you on the next project, okay? And you will be put apart. And then you will have to make a group of people who are, for example, let's say you are selfish, you you don't share, okay? People don't want to work with you because it's less efficient. It's not a question of being nice or being fair, just less efficient. The group is progressing like, so all your body will feel that you are not involved and stuff like that so you will be put apart then there will be a group of people who are selfish and then they will have to readapt and that works wonderfully uh, it's the same for example if you i always speak about uh, like uh, a lot of people are speaking about um, um, uh, fairness and uh, what what you would call uh, ethic okay so i have been i have been studying in uh, in stanford and i have a I had a class of ethics, okay, with someone who was teaching me who is now in jail, okay. He was involved in he was involved in the what was the name? Uh, uh, wait, wait he met. he teached uh, ethics. Yeah, he was teaching ethics in Stanford. He was in Stanford. Okay, wow. Now, now he was he was in WorldCom. You know, this WorldCom uh, problems they had in uh, it was uh, like twenty years ago, okay. But so what I what I am trying to say it's uh, <laughs> he was teaching the ethics and he got to the jail. Okay, okay. And 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 but okay, everyone tell you what to you should do, but they don't make you experience it. Okay, mm. so you have a class, and in the same time you see that society just next to you shows that the people who don't do it that way succeed more than the others. Okay, and so what they tell you it's how you should 
present, but not how you should do. Even if you have class, I have been I have been students in HSC in France. I don't know if you know HSC. It's a, it's a business school. It's the best business school in Europe, by the way. It's Paris Business School. Uh, we have a class of of ethic, okay. But mainly, what they explain you is how you play with ethic, how you stay presentable without mm. really having the side effect. Okay. When you are in a group, when you are in a community, okay, and when you teach, for example, a school zero one. It's a small community, like 200 students. Okay, everyone knows you. So if you are not fair, very fast, others will just adapt and say, "Okay, I don't want to work with you." And and there is no uh, no hierarchy. So each time, each student chooses who is who is going to work with. So first group, you will be in a group, you will abuse your group, and you will get the credit for it. Okay, that's okay. But everyone in this group will feel bad. And next group, they will say, okay, no, I want to work with, with you. Okay, and slowly by slowly, either you will adapt or you will be totally reject and fail. So you leave the soft skills. Same for communication and everything. Each time they have to do something, they have to communicate. And so I would say it's a kind of Darwinian process where everyone has to leave its own. And some people, for example, have some weakness in some skills, okay, but they will learn how to adapt to it either develop, either find a way to use it another way. So for example, it's something very interesting. In school 42 in Paris, we had a very high level of autist, autist students. Okay, people, students who have autism. Not very deep autism, but like autism. Okay, but in traditional schools, they have very hard time because they have to have all the same set of skills. There, they will be able to adapt their skill and maybe find mm. some kind of people they are more efficient and can get be gateway between them and groups. Okay, so we, what the, I mean, I'm trying to explain. We are driven by the result. At the end of the day, what you want is to make a project, to make it work. Okay, and by and, and we will do that. A normal students in two years will do like 60 projects. So he has plenty of time to fail, find strategy, and adapt. Speak with others. You know, most of the time, the students when they will do a project, they will fail. After they will argue, why did we fail? Uh, you didn't do your job, whatever. And and slowly by slowly, they will learn how to recognize the people they work correctly with, the people who are efficient with them, and the ones who are not efficient, they will be left alone. And then they will make a group of people who are not efficient, and they will have to adapt. You know, when when you have people who are um, lazy, when they are a group of lazy people, they share the work perfectly. They are very, very attentive of who is doing what. I have been very observative. But when you have people who are really lazy, when they are with other lazy people, they are really efficient because they don't want to be full. They love to fool other, but they don't want to be full. So everyone is checking each other. So this is, I think, we teach much more human skills than most of the most of the school. And by the way, something also people don't understand when you do in a school like uh, like Zone Zero, the students spend most of their time arguing to each other. So there is much more human interaction than in a normal school where you have a teacher, a teacher having lectures, okay? And, and if, you, if you have visit, you see that the, the place is much more noisy than a normal school. So we, we, ha we, have, to have, we have to put some, some physical stuff to absorb noise because students speak. They spend, you know, when, when you code a software, you spend 90% of your time speaking about the software. The coding, it's 10%. Mm. That's unusual, most absolutely. Of the time, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you usually, and, and it's like your screen. You are your screen and a code, right? And uh, <laughs> in this case, it's like human interaction. It's 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 unique. Uh, so, yeah. You know what? What they, we give them a challenge. We never give them how to solve it. So they spend most of the time to argue how to solve it, try, fail, <laughs> speak to others, and they spend and and we spend all the time. We get challenge more complex. So they can't just act. Okay. They have to argue to each other. You know, I don't know if you know something called a merina, uh, not a merina, uh, a yeshiva. It. Yeshiva, it's, a, it's how Jush learn the Torah. How <laughs> Jush learn the, the Torah. They do it exactly in the same process. It's an argue process. I mean, we have, they, they put a, a situation like, for example, your neighbor stole something to another. What should we do? Should we kill him? Should we whatever? Okay. Mm. And then they argue. So make a group. And someone say, okay, we should kill him. But the guy say, okay, no, God did that. And the, the truth come out of the argumentation, of the fact that as a group, okay, it's difficult to fool 
a group of people. Okay, when they are calm, of course, when you use emotion, that's terrible. But when you have people who are calm and they can play on their mind, you can very deeply make it fall. By the way, it's also the process of science. Of science, huh? when, when you have, how do we do science? At the end of the day, we argue. That's a, we someone say, okay, I think it's some some that way, and this guy say, oh, no, that if it would be mm. that way, that wouldn't work. And by a group, you know, when when you have the Descartes process, is just be uh, be careful of what you think. When you are alone, it's very easy to fool yourself, but it's very difficult to fool a group. Okay, the, so yeah. it's, when we have a community, when when you have a community of people, when you are able to convince the community, which and I put one bemol, which is the emotion. That's something that's going to be very bad. But when you have some some activity where the emotion is low, you get very very close to the truth, and very everyone has to develop. You know, well, funny though is like one of my friends in London uh, is speaking all the time about tribal thinking. So that uh, human beings are wired to be in a tribe. So and this globalization process and 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 um, uh, out of uh, tribe living um, kind of creates something like a, a little bit uh, chaotic perception of reality right now. So this uh, mode, uh, what you are telling, I still believe that uh, in a core, uh, what helps to create these new skills of. Uh, Soft skills uh, are uh, kind of uh, rooted in social conformity because what you said, for example, I will be rejected. I won't be uh, kind of expected to to join uh, next next project because I was like uh, behaving like an ass, you know. Uh, and uh, so this is like the in a good sense, this is social conformity. Uh, my my I question. Mean, I would I I wouldn't call conformity because conformity for me it's some rules were preset. That means something which is not thought together. That's in what we do. We do it in a way of, I would say, social effectivity. Because at the end of the day, you have to solve a problem. We are a group. We are a community which mm. has challenge, and we want to solve mm. it. I agree with that. Uh, it doesn't uh, contradict, in my opinion. It just you have a goal. So, for example, there is this goal. We need to solve this project, right? And we are moving towards this goal. And there comes this uh, uh, a, uh, one additional question because, uh, in terms of social conformity, on for example, group pressure. Uh, so, when we are arguing, uh, good uh, feeling uh, about this from uh, my perspective comes from the uh, aspect that we are goal oriented, right? So we need to achieve this goal from one aspect, and we want to be in a in a some kind of harmony, right? While doing this, because if we hate each other, it 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 will be harder to reach the goal. So there is just this yin yang uh, concept of that. Though uh, the question what appears right now is that, I, uh, yeah. I don't think I I don't agree on that, because for okay. example, I asked, I spoke with some students, especially. Uh, I relate some students, for example, will tell you, okay, I am much more efficient with, when I work with students that I, I don't get along with. And emotionally or conceptually? That, emotionally or conceptually? Because yeah, there, there, there's, emo there's difference. Emotionally, I mean, uh, they don't, they say when I go, work with some friends where I have very good sympathy, I am much less efficient because I, I will be less pushy and stuff like that. So they find a balance. And what is interesting is that each student will find his own balance. You have students that are able to work only with friends, only with a very, uh, a very uh, quiet and very peaceful group. And some groups are very challenging. They, they love people who are yep. always contradicting yep. themselves. Mm -hmm. And what I, I think each one finds his own way. And what is important to understand, we are not the same. Everyone is very different. And at some point, we, need, we have different needs. They can evolve. Uh, clearly, you can make them evolve, but some people are not able to stand a wonderful pressure which will make a group amazingly efficient. Some people are able, some people get along with some specific people. You know, for example, I had, I had, um, I remember I had one, one girl in, it was in Epitech. She was known to be very bad in tech, but all our groups were working wonderfully. She mm. was, and she's now working, I don't know if you know Essilor. They make glasses. It's one of the biggest glasses company in France. And she managed 2,000 people right now. And she's someone who is not take picky, but mm. make groups efficient. And she's not nice. She's hard, but she brings something. And what, they, what people learn is to have this chemistry. And I don't think there is one chemistry. You no, know, I always describe a group of color like a, like a group of hard rock uh, musicians. You know, there is, a, there is some kind of 
uh, of chemistry of a group. And that's something, I don't know if you already hire people in IT, but that's very touchy because so, when you bring someone in a group, you can break the old stuff by putting someone who is not fitting in it, okay? So if you want to have a very creative group, it's something which is very specific and it's not, it's not uh, just adding skills to people. It's also a way of sharing, a way of interacting and some groups does work. And what people learn in Zone Zero One or in 42, they learn to recognize where they are efficient, where they can bring stuff. Uh, they learn to recognize the early sign that that stuff is going to be wrong because you know stuff goes always slowly. You have you have a group, everyone is friend, and every it starts very nice, and then it goes curse slowly by slowly because there is plenty. And what they learn that, for example, I have spoke, I have done a lot of uh, psychological. Uh, uh, discussion with students, they, they tell you, uh, uh, students they tell you that, okay, uh, now I, I know that when there is a problem, I have to say it right now. If I wait, it would be always worse. And you know, this kind of stuff, when you leave it, it's something very strong because a lot of people always think, oh, it will get better by later and stuff. And you don't learn that in school. You learn it by failure. When you see the, the you had all your friends and after six months, you hate each other because you just didn't speak correctly at start. And of course you fail and you lose four friends and you do it again. And slowly by slowly you learn to see, okay, now I have to tell him that he's abusing me, otherwise they will get back. And that's what you live. You live it every day. You know, when, when you are in a, in a channel, you, you need plenty of stuff. You need a group, big enough. That's very important to have enough opportunities. So you are not stuck with people and you can fail and go find other people who are willing to do it again with you. You need a challenging environment where you have real challenge because if it's too easy, it doesn't work. If it's too hard, it doesn't work neither. So you have to have a rich environment. If you see, for example, when you when you visit London, you see that students are not working in the same group, in the same kind of problems because they evolve differently. And you need a kind of very um, safe environment where you know that you can fail and do it again. It won't be dramatic. That like well, In school, it's very awful because when the students fail, they have to redo it again. And they, 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 they fail a full year. They are not able to fail a small stuff and do it again, have another group of people, uh, people. It's a, the safe, the, the, I, I don't know the English name, bienveillance, it's a well-being maybe. Uh, you know, when, when you care about other people, you, you mm. just don't, uh, you, you, you know that people are, are weak and they can fail, but it's okay, we will do it again. And, we, that's very important to have this kind of culture. Failing is not a problem. We we trust you. You will make it again, and you will have other people to support you later and whatever. Because mm -hmm. it's it's emotionally it's hard. Of course, it's hard to fail emotionally. So you need to have the institution to be in a, in the setting so that you can recognize your effort. Okay, we recognize the effort. We don't grade them. That's very important. So so because in in school, in normal school, you tend to reward even failure. That's not good. You don't reward failure. You say, okay, you failed, you failed. You didn't get great, but you can do it again. And it's not important. You will have enough time to, to, to recover. But failure is failure. That's important. When it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when you make it blurry, like you have like in France, for example, when you, you have a project which doesn't work in normal school, you will get 12 out of 20. What is this 12? In, in the other one, it's zero or 20. You have, it makes, it works, or it doesn't work. No one buy a car which explodes, okay? They, you don't buy it cheaper. You just don't buy it, okay? So you have to understand when you fail, you fail. But when you can start it again, and we will help you to do it because what we want, it's a full project. Yeah. So, you know, uh, this, uh, this, this topic of failure is actually bigger than I thought before because uh, I, I have, I, I have uh, worked with that a lot. Uh, we had a uh, five months or six months learning program for uh, opening your potential. And uh, what I noticed, and uh, it was project-based. So what I believe, as, 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 you, as you are saying repeatedly, that uh, when we practice, we learn. And uh, we did uh, projects uh, with the youngsters uh, together. And uh, what I noticed and... Uh, that, uh, for example, there were two really nice friends, uh, they were trading this project together and uh, they did manage to do that. And this is what, what exactly you are saying, that uh, there are that you need uh, to have different, uh, sometimes really unique and actually always unique uh, kind of combinations of people to go for result. 
uh, not always nice, not always kind of uh, your cup of tea. But anyways, you start to understand that if your goal is to reach this goal, achieve this goal, so you are adapting towards that goal. So subconsciously, yes. your inter uh, intrinsic motivation becomes achieving this goal. And by that sense, I totally agree with you. My question would be, I suppose, uh, kind of uh, because I am a little bit, uh, not a little bit, uh, a lot uh, in spirituality questions uh, about mindfulness, about uh, kind of uh, knowing methods how to deal with stress better, maybe knowing methods how to uh, improve my empathy or something like that. Because I believe that there is layers, deep layers, what we can uh, develop uh, as a human beings, as a, as a society. Uh, anyways, uh, what I what I hear from you, Nikolai, is it's really insp inspirational, uh, really, uh, and and. Uh, there are a lot of things that I'm coming uh, from and thinking about tribalism, about social conformity, about the social skills that you're telling, uh, how it evolves, and, and uh, it's, it sounds really, really wonderful. And uh, maybe you could tell what is, uh, so we have talked some like 65 minutes right now, wonderful conversation, and uh, what is your or are your goals in the next five years? Uh, because uh, 5 million uh, coders or t 20 million coders in a global, global uh, scale, it's, 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 it's huge, right? What is your? What are your goals? So my my, uh, my goal is to start a process of of exponential growing of this zero one school. So it's the whole idea, okay, it's to make uh, what we call uh, zone zero one. The zone zero one. It's in the same time uh, area where we create collective intelligence, where we train new talent, and when we make added value with those talent. And we want all this zone to win money and use this money to create other schools, other zones. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a viral process. Okay, so each school, each it's not a school, it's zone that we open as the mission to open other school and other zone. Okay, so when when we will start that, it will grow, and we plan to have like 200 schools all over Africa in the next 10 years and train around 1 million a year. Okay, so we, it's a process of exponential. When it starts, it will, it will go f very fast. So that's our, our, our goal to have plenty. Because right now it's, we are in a very insane situation. We have billions of talent which are not developed and which are full of talent. We know that, we have statistics. And in the same time, we have lack of talent at, at minimum, that's, that's ridiculous. Okay, so we try to make the gap in between with a process which is self-sustainable, who creates its own capability to develop. So we try to have, uh, I would say, an organic process of development that will grow up to, up to filling the need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Nicola, uh, I wish uh, you all the best and uh, by the way, thanks for your team uh, arranging meeting in London with your uh, London campus and uh, as I understand, uh, I, I was in talent just to visit the talent campus, uh, they weren't uh, kind of on the site but uh, I suppose we'll go to see with our team uh, talent campus as well and uh, wish you all the best and uh, actually I, I suppose uh, we will t keep in touch and maybe you could send me via email these books what you said uh, you, yeah, uh, I will. yeah uh, because I, I have read one book of Ken Robinson uh, about uh, uh, about uh, how to find your talent about this this concept fifth element called uh, kind of that that was really oh, no, that's a, that's all one uh, I don't remember the name but he wrote one lately much more about how the stuff put itself in place and how it was uh, uh, an answer to the need of uh, a need of uh, industrial mm. time. Mm. Yeah. And anyway, he he, and is, I, he was such an inspirational figure, right? Uh, yeah, great. He's a great sell, seller, uh, for so to speak, for a mark, marketing guy for uh, education, uh, kind of that. Okay, Nicola, thanks for your time, and uh, I hope that uh, heat wave in, in Europe uh, won't uh, hit uh, 45 degrees again, right? And uh, kudos to your team. Thanks for your team, and uh, you're 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 really inspirational uh, guy, and uh, I hope that you will succeed, and maybe we can do some stuff together. Thank you very much. Okay, merci beaucoup. Uh, Merci, okay, bonne, au revoir. Bonne journée. <laughs> Merci.